Hello and uh, welcome to another instalment of Foraging in uh, Covid times. These strange, challenging and exciting times we find ourselves in. Now today's video is quite a long one but it's it's been one of the most enjoyable for me because it it didn't start with the idea of making a video and for me the the best day, the most precious times I have foraging is very often when it just unfolds kind of spontaneously. I don't really go out with an idea. So, so because of that, I, I kind of realized it doesn't have a, any proper introduction. So, so this is it. And it started me with me going for a cycle and then as I so often like to do, I, I noticed um, a path that I've never seen before. So I decided to, to take that, that path, that new gateway to adventure and just see what unfolded. And uh, so this is, this is shot over a couple of days, the kind of general narrative I've, I've tried to kind of put it into is, is as if it's like one day but it but it isn't but but this is this is the the foraging adventure that unfolded enjoy i should also just add that as in all these videos there are timestamps which i didn't know what that meant until recently but it means that you can i've i've divided up the the whole contents of this video in the description below and you can just click on something that kind of interests you and go straight there. Um, yeah. So I came out to get some more young oak leaves to make tea, like I demonstrated in a previous video. And well, actually look at these, because they're so gorgeous, like the two kind of tone in the leaf is just how I like them. But I didn't expect to find what I just showed you in the, the little clip, which is jewels. The only thing is, on these lower branches, there's few, most of them, like way up there. Can see lots and lots of them. So I'm going to have to fashion myself a large kind of hooky stick so I can drag these down because I've got a feeling these are going to make probably one of the most unusual pickles I've made. I mean I tasted one and I make a lot of oak gall ink, and usually oak galls are very tannic, but I don't actually harvest them when they are that young, whatever variety I'm using. So to be honest, I've not tasted them at this point. So maybe the, the kind of marble galls are also really kind of mild tasting, but I would say that these are really attractive and that's one of the first thing that draws draws me when in when I think about a, a wild food or potential wild food. The other thing is, it's quite unusual. It's got a nice size to it, and it's got a really great texture. It's it's succulent, uh, kind of neutral in flavour. Will probably take on the flavours of whatever kind of pickle one puts them in whether it's a mild brine that possibly might kind of shrink them a little bit I'm not sure that'll work but um, a vinegar pickle or just just put them in some kind of marinade for a, a few weeks possibly prick them once and do that or just scatter them on on salads now this is me at my at my <laughs> wild food experimentalist best or worst depending on your perspective but yeah let's see if I can get a few 
Let's go and get that stick. Look in the woods. This bluebells are still out. It's quite a shady wood, so. Right. Anyway, off for the search. I really want is one with a. Um, oh look, one of my uh, favourite things: mushroom limpets. What I really want is one that's got a back-facing stick um, or branch that I can use as a hook. Look at this! Wow. An old, uh, absolute woodland sculpture. It's like an old, old oak. I imagine that was a bit of a, a bit of furniture in your house. I don't know, an alternative. Uh, bookcase or or having a putting a lovely plant plant growing in there or something hmm. see something I didn't bring my knife so I can't cut anything. Oh look, lots of yellow uh, lots of yellow archangel around. Been visited by the bees. Just a bit like well very much like red dead nettle in the sense that what the bee knows is that it's got a little nectary at the bottom of the flower. So you can kind of pinch that out and get a little bit of sweet nectar at the bottom. Got this oak. Actually, it's, it's this. Quite good. Got a nice, uh, almost backward facing hooky bit. Hmm. Yeah, I think that could be the one. Ha! Huh. Look, it's hollow. I mean, I'm just never cease to be amazed by the resilience of some trees I and mean, I think particularly of yew and oak and and beech. Sometimes they can be just completely hollowed out and uh, and yet they still not just survive but they thrive. Right let's go and try out this stick. Oh look, we're right by the path again. See, I don't know this wood, I've never been here before. It's just on the edge of this footpath here. Who left their bicycle there? The bicycle. It's mine. Oh, a bit windy. Now, there they are. And let's see. Why? Hook that in there. In there. Drag this down. Yep, seems to be working, but not one-handed, so 
to leave you for now. So I've just looked around the corner after picking a good load from that last tree and uh, I, mean, I, I looked around on the floor to see if I could find any um, the cups of the acorns but I couldn't find any because although I thought it was probably English oak or sessile oak I wasn't 100% sure but I found one around the corner it's not so laden with with um, the galls but look there's some um, some of the acorn cases left over and they've got no stalk or virtually any right close to the uh, stem so this is a sessile oak because it's kind of interesting because I thought galls like this um, were only on turkey oak although clearly this isn't because of the leaf shape but fascinating I've just stopped here because I've spotted another kind of oak gall now you can see just there much much fatter and now this is the only type of oak gall that I've eaten it's about 15 years ago and it was absolutely repulsive and really tannic so that's I guess why I was pleasantly surprised actually delighted and amazed by the taste of these young succulent woodland black wild black currant looking like ones um, yeah just pulled it down for a closer look so it almost looks like a meddler or something but uh, I'm not sure whether that's an old one I mean it's very soft but it doesn't have the kind of apple kind of look they're often like green with kind of a rosy kind of blush on them when they're really young but yeah I, don't know. I mean these are clearly old ones very old ones here These are my favourite kind of days foraging. Just really ambling around with no no real purpose. Ah, oh, look, we're just getting at the time of the year when we have these new growths coming from the, the bramble. Talking about that a lot in a video coming up just because there's so much fun to work with right I'm just going here in here on the I've never been into this wood but just on the random chance that lovely hawthorn great for pickling um, the mushroom gods might be smiling on me today and uh, there's ash around Quite a bit of ash around so I just wonder if there could possibly be some dried saddle and also with all this oak around maybe some young chicken of the woods So here's a an old la ash line down and you can tell that straight away just because I spotted mushroom limpets on it. AKA Crampbles, King Alfred's Cakes. No sign yet of the other mushrooms I'm looking for.
doesn't that look so much like kind of sheep poo or something. <laughs> like go get some of those because they make great paint ink. But no dried saddle yet or at all. The other thing I'm looking for is probably not so much evidence of old dried saddle apart from kind of hollowed out ash, but also old chicken of the woods, like really dried out ones, which would be kind of washed out white and powdery from last year or previous years. old oak. Another example of the resili resilience of trees. So, I mean, a lot of it is dying, but it's still, it's fallen over, but it's still very much thriving in the upper, upper branches. Spotted some old elder lying on its side over there. It's always worth checking elder. Might find some... Oh yeah, I am going to find some jelly mushrooms. Look at those, they're quite good ones. Ever bagless. I know for a lot of you, it's almost become a cliche now to, uh, to kind of use these in sweet ways, but seeing as this is what we found, I might just take you through that particular recipe because I'm not doing this live I can just do snapshots of the different stages Ooh, look. yeah so elder is, is something that's really worth recognizing as a kind of dead, dead tree, or, well, I mean, this one is, we've got, we've got two, we've got this dead one where the bark is smooth, but you still have these like really kind of gnarly bits on there. And then we've got another one that's close by. It's still got the bark, which is kind of, I think of it as kind of elephant-like. And then we've got, oh, we've got the new growth there and these very distinct kind of irregular markings up the bark and then we also got climb back over something I'm going to talk about when I do a video just celebrating elder is we've got these rapidly growing shoots you see that Bend it down. Ooh. So, looks like I'm just yanking these off, but I'm being actually relatively careful to get them off whole and intact. I'm not just kind of ripping 
ripping them to bits. So. Not that it affects their edibility, but it does affect their appearance when you're working with them in recipes. If you've got them all kind of shredded up, torn, torn up. That's plenty. what I just discovered over here and this is something that's going to feature in another recipe and I don't mean that I'm going to eat them but going to they're going to help me and here are the helpers They're just enjoying the sun, the massing, as they do in the spring. And if they go out and then kind of divide up and form more colonies or, you know, how, how, I don't know, the life kind of cycle and, and the way can ants behave. But, Oh look, we've got some stitch wart here. It's very closely related to chickweed, so can I use the flowers? I mean, you could eat the whole thing, but I find that mm, not bad. I mean, I tend to find that the leaves are a little bit tough, but actually. That was okay. Oops. This is very, very pointed leaves. Mm. Actually, it's not a great, it's not a great eating experience. I can feel it slightly kind of catching my throat just a little bit. Just a little bit tough. Oh, what's going on in there on that log? Oh, it's another. Well, this is part of the trail formed by those ants. Look, they're going along this one too. But it's covered with. Ah, it's another member of the Ricularia genus, which most people are familiar with in terms of jelly ear fungus, or what used to be called Jew's ear, wood ear, jelly ear fungus, Ricularia, auricular judea. This one, this one is commonly called tripe fungus. It's also an edible species, and I really like it, but don't come across it quite as often as the jelly ear. The ants seem to like it too. But let's have a little look at one more closely. I'll take it away. See if I avoid. It's kind of quite wrinkled on the underside. Wood lice hanging out there too. Yeah, and we'll take a little bit of that back. I'm going to cook today with a very random selection of things, which is kind of always nice, actually. Not necessarily saying they all go together, but it'll just be to show you some of the things that you can you can do when you do just come across a quite a random selection on a walk. And they're almost kind of kind of rough on the top, not quite hairy, but a bit rough. It's very jelly, 
very jelly-like, very rubbery, rubbery texture. Let's have a little look. Oh look, we've got lots of uh, pink campion. It's another lovely flower to put on a salad. I mean, it's slightly bitter. I think it's quite high in saponin, so it's not one for making kind of soup with. At least not as far as I'm aware. Look, there it is at a younger stage. Almost looking like a plantain or something, but the rib structure is very different. Wood ants and mushroom limpets. I expect if we follow this all the way along, I wonder if we'd get to a new mound or they are just coming from the big one. Oh, look, a bluebell. I want to show you something I attempted to do in the video on pickling, but didn't work. So I think I will. We have bluebell, a slightly better one, back to the, the main colony. And this is actually very closely related to how I'm gonna, gonna work with these ants. Although, it will possibly slightly irritate them, but so have a look at the, the color of the bluebell. And then just kind of rub that in there. We're not going to bash it around so that we squash the ants. It's just ants biting it there and the formic acid. It's just changing the color of the bluebell from blue to a pink bell. <laughs> Blow, blowing that one off my finger. You smell this, it smells just like if you've got some fish and chips, hot fish and chips, and you put vinegar on. It just smells like that, look at that. also saw, look down in there, there is actually one of the, uh, the ghouls that I've been picking. It's like a little green grape. I think that's probably just fallen from the tree because it's under an oak. It was interesting because I was gathering or I was drawn to these ones as I was walking along to get some young leaves for tea, but actually most of them are in the process of being farmed by the ants. You can see it's, uh, it's pretty much a seems to be going on. So on the underside of these leaves, You can see the really curled up leaves and you can't focus it but there's um there's lots of aphids in there and it really distorts like the growth of the the growth of the uh there we are just disturbed this one
There we are. That's all the kind of aphids up there. I guess the aphids are extracting the the sugars from the tree and then the ants are feeding on them. So very, very industrious, clever, inspiring foragers, these ants. Doing a better job than I am finding what they need. Should take inspiration and carry on my search. Still searching, but uh, not finding any chicken in the woods. But I'm really enjoying this this walk. I don't know where I am. I'm lost now. I mean, really lost. Well, I know I'm in Kent, near Herne Bay, but uh, I've been going around kind of field edges and just kind of amazes me how quickly the season marches on and the oak leaves go from that lovely kind of young juvenile almost puppy stage to this kind of darker green and I was just just honing in on these uh, these leaves here to pick some leaves and the first leaf I was about to grab I interrupted some romance almost Shield bug love. Continue the search. It's another couple. This is what spring does to you. Sorry, disturbed that couple. I just kind of noticed this sapling and it's it's one of my favourite leaves. I mean, it's such a unusual shape that if you see this in the woodland, it's bound to kind of capture your attention. It, it kind of looks, particularly if we take the basal lobes away, it kind of starts to look a bit sycamore-y, but it's not. So I saw this little sapling, which kind of makes me look up obviously and there we are we found a mature well not a mature tree but certainly a much bigger one so this is the the famous checker checker tree famous um, in the sense that so many pubs are called the checkers and they take the name from from this and it's a sorbus one of the members of the sorbus genus sorbus terminalis i i think and the exciting point of view from 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 a fruit perspective from a forager's perspective is the lovely berries it has which a bit like medlars have to be kind of ideally bletted so softened by the frost but they are, they're absolutely delicious. They're kind of, at that, at that stage, they're, I, what colour? I mean, they are kind of brownish, kind of rougey brown, brownish colour, kind of speckled. About the size of, size of, size, but yeah, they're about the size of a pea. So that's exciting. So I kind of, I'm, I'm still lost, to be honest, but I'm kind of, at this point, what I often do, if I find something that you know, could be a great chicken of the woods, which I'm looking for, it could be whatever, but I find it, then at that point, I decide, right, I don't want to be lost anymore. And I try and work out from this point where I am. Um, and, you know, from here on the way out so that I can I can come back here because I hardly ever see these growing in, in in the wild is part I think partly I'm just I just don't notice I might pass by and think it's a sycamore or, or something like that um but yeah that's a great find I'm going to look around and see if I can 
find some more. So this is this is this is the joy of just kind of aimless rambling, really. Yeah, I'm nominally looking for chicken of the woods or um, dried saddle, but you know it doesn't really matter if I don't find them. I mean, part of the joy is just being out here anyway, because it's lovely and sunny today in kind of intermittent periods. And you just never know what you're going to come across. That's, that's the magic and mystery of foraging. Look at this. I, uh, I showed you stitchwort earlier. Lesser stitchwort. But look at that. So when, when I, I was just looking through, when I see kind of white flowers in that density in the woodland, I'm kind of thinking wild garlic. But rarely do I see stitchwort in such celebratory abundance. I mean, it's just glorious. So, you know, a lot of the time, actually, I don't care whether something's good to eat or not. It's just lovely to be around, around plants, particularly, you know, when they're so healthy like this. So healthy. And I kind of talk to people about... You know, eating a good range of wild plants is good for your health, but you know, equally important is just being amongst them without any consideration whatsoever of their utility as food or medicine, just to enjoy them. I'm not going to go any further in because I don't want to tread on them. The search continues. So just coming out of this oak woodland, I can see one of my favourite plants to gather at this time of year. Um, oh, by the way, it's not this one, all this kind of green here, that kind of indicates that there's a, a ditch around. It's a hemlock water dropwort, just coming into flower. Looks a bit like flat leaf parsley or something like this. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, known for inducing this sardonic grin when you eat the tubers, presumably accidentally. And uh, yeah, they're kind of poisonous, so it can have an effect on your kind of muscles. But look into the origins of that, it's quite, quite interesting. But it's a good one to, to know. But I don't really want to, just so you can avoid it, but I, I don't want to get into that just now, because I want to focus on edibles. And I've just seen, I put my bike down here, this lovely row of dock. I'm sorry, when I say dock, I should be clear. Um, I mean burdock, not dock. Dock is, that's dock. Burdock. So look, here's the, the old growth. Be careful how I get in there because they're, they're stick to me. Give them half the chance. Look at that. And it shows, it shows you how big it can grow. My goodness, there's one sticking to my hat. I knew, I knew, it, I knew it would. Um, but yeah, I'm going to put this down so you can you can you can see how big that gets
it's um I would say it's about eight foot this one. So it's quite unusual. That's partly why I showed it to you. Typically it gets to about my height, which is yeah, not not eight <laughs> not eight foot, that's for sure. But that's kind of showing as well how this is a perennial, so that's the second year growth. And this is also like a lot of second year growth, but that, that is the second year growth when it's, you know, after it's gone to, to uh, flower and then seed, and then it's died and it's left like the old parts, which is, you know, when you see things like that, it's a, a good opportunity to look around for the, um, the plants that would be first year growth or second, new second year growth like we've got here. And I know it's second year growth because it's putting out central flowering stem. And this is what I'm really interested in. Because you might come across books and I've seen reference to it. <laughs> it's that got me. Um, to eating the stems of burdock. So when you see that, if it doesn't give enough information, you might be thinking that it's just one of these, let's see, I'll get one to show you. It's one of these stems here coming off like the main flowering stem. Well, that would be hard pressed to eat anything from there because it's really like full of fibers. Uh oh, now there's some really fun things we could do with those fibers to make them kind of edible, but Generally, when we're thinking about eating the stem of burdock, we're thinking about this. And we're not thinking about it at any time, so we're not thinking about it in really July, August, September, and the rest of the year. We're really thinking about it in May. And not just that, because things aren't always completely aligned with, with like, um, their usual seasonal appearance, but that, that's generally the time. But really it's a case of that, combined with the fact that it's really flexible, like this. And what we're looking for is to pick it really near the base, but not right at the base, because we want to give it a chance to be able to produce some flowers, even though we've picked the majority of the stem. So I'll show you how to do that and what we could do with it. I've got my knife and uh, yeah well I guess if I was thinking about burdock in a traditional way I wouldn't have a knife I would have a, a spade or a, a, a fork and I'd be digging the roots because that's the most traditional edible part but although I might get s some decent root off a plant like this on its second year of growth, particularly like secondary, thick secondary shoots off the main shoot. The main shoot at the moment is giving most of its energy and starch, um, and by that, all the things that make it would make it a nice tender root. It's giving it all to produce this big stem. So, on second year growth, not really ones for going for roots. That would be first year growth. Uh, if you look around and they don't have this central stem but what I'm going to do is strip down these leaves, outer leaves. Now I have used these leaves as a hop sub substitute for making beer because they're quite bitter so you could use them if particularly if you're thinking this is quite wasteful. But really to get the most out of the stem, you want to go really close to the base. But, although from an edibility point of view, you could go right to the base, what I like to do is, if you can see, you see, which leaves are that? I can't see, see what's in the way. Uh, there. So you see that we've got a, a big 
a big leaf stalk here coming off the base and we've got little shoots coming out of it. Boy, there we are, these little shoots coming out of it. So what I'm going to do is though I could cut below that, I'm going to cut above that because then that will produce a flowering shoot, another one, especially because I've cut this one off. So you see that's kind of quite thick isn't it? So what I'll do with this, so I'm going to get quite a few of these and I'm going to peel them with a knife but I'm going to do it when I get back. The reason being is that this discolours like potatoes if you don't put them in in water. But I'll just show you one now and then by the time you get home, in about an hour or so, you'll see how brown it is. Now, of all the succulent stems that you could eat the, the core of, this is my personal favourite for several reasons. One, it's much bigger than all the others. Two, Heals really easily. Three, tastes really good. And four, you can do multiple things with it. So, probably the simplest thing, if you've seen any of my videos before, you probably know what I'm going to say. Um, you could dip it in hummus and just eat it raw. Then, another thing you could do is just bake it or braise it or steam it. I actually, I candy a lot of them. That's one thing I do. But what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna grate it and we're gonna make kind of like burdock stem hash browns essentially. So look, you really want it to be super flexible. If it's not super flexible, it's going to have too much fibre going on. So there we are, I'll get a few, a few more. But note the colour of this now. Actually smells of potato too. I wonder if it's got the, some of the same um, chemistry that results in it going brown. Interesting, it smells just like raw potato. What I would say about this kind of little colony here is because they are so densely packed together that when I do try and look for ones with thick stems, a lot of them, they're, look at that, it's like, this one here, I don't know if you can see that, kind of there. Let's see, but anyway, the point is because they're so crowded together that they're really quite small compared to when you see, like, you know, a plant here walk a few feet, another plant, they'd be much bigger, much better. So like, this is this is this is perfect here. It's really perfect there. And you can see there's some more up there. Let's just have a look up ahead. Some there. And, oh, we got this one, which is just absolutely ideal. In fact, I'll just show you this again, this whole thing again. I won't kind of talk through. I'll just, just do it. Yeah. Let's see, can you see? This tripod wants to fall over. There we
one thing I forgot to mention, and that that is that when you're peeling, when you're peeling it, it can discolour your hands. I don't know if you can see that. It's not quite as bad as walnuts if you've ever handled green walnut cases. But um, it does discolour them for a while, so you might want to do that with gloves. Now, you might also think that this is pretty wasteful. So, just in my desire to not waste anything, I don't know if you saw my last video, but at the end there's a clip of me wearing a suit made out of burdock leaves. And that was one of my, one of my solutions to not wasting the, the leaves. The other thing I thought I would do actually is, I don't know that I'll make a burdock suit this year, I might, but maybe with these stems, which I've said aren't much good, I'll show you something like kind of ultra chefy that you could do with them. But we've got quite a lot now, so. All those. Perfect. So just down from the, the burdocks, we've got something which I talk about a, a lot in other videos. I made an ash whistle, and I think the last one is, yeah, ash, ash tree. This one is, look, absolutely magnificent. It's, well, you just can't really get from this how truly amazing it really is. But it is. And, uh, yeah. So I talked about the tradition of using these to kind of adulterate tea, but how at this time of year, particularly you see the, uh, those really young leaves have still got that kind of orange in there. That's the perfect time of year for using them as a vegetable. So although I've talked about it, I'm gonna, because I think I'm, I'm just, this kind of video is just kind of the content is just being dictated by a pretty random forage. So I just thought I'll kind of work with most things and just cook them up so you can actually see it being done rather than me just talk about what you could do. It's kind of nice to see it demonstrated even if it's a really kind of simple thing. So we get, oh, there's a wonderful aroma of something around here. Maybe it's that. No, it's not, sorry. It's not that, I don't know what it is. So a few of those. Ah, I know what it is. It's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm stepping on some, let's see. Uh, stepping on some aromatic ground ivy. There it is in flower. But I saw just up here, another ash that, well, there's this one here. Oh, there. They're all at just slightly different stages here. This one's a, a little further behind. I'll take one from there, actually. But talked about pickling ash keys in the last video and well we've got some up there I can't reach them but look I've got this on a tripod so I can lift it and show you see I don't know if you can see that maybe not I don't think that was very successful you saw anything uh, see that 
Anyway, the point is, they were at the same stage as the ones I was pickling in the previous video, which is perfect. But I just wanted to show you some which might look great, particularly because they're such kind of lush, huge clusters. Here they are. There's another tree. So they're kind of a bit hidden behind the leaves there. But look at these. This one here. Lovely looking clusters. But unless they are, well, I'm going to do the kind of test. I talk about which is that actually that wasn't so bad test is you should be able to bite it and see that little bit there where it's just like from where my finger is about a sunflower seed size bit going upwards above that it should yeah see it's not it should be able to come away without any real resistance there's way too much resistance in that one which kind of tells me that although these look great and big and like they might pickle really well they're actually too far gone for pickling. It's like borderline, but my experience of working with borderline ones is that if, you, if you're going to boil them to moderate the bitterness, which you might do, just that act of boiling them can make them go as tough as old boots. If you don't, if you're not too worried about bitterness and it is kind of borderline like this and you cold pickle it, not going to be a problem, but yeah. See? A bit tough, getting a bit tough. But anyway, there is something that I spotted like through the trees in, in the woods um, a little while back that I thought, yeah, there might be some more. But it's a really exciting ingredient. If I don't find some more, we go back to the other one. But uh, And that's butcher's broom. Do you know butcher's broom? It's one where, again, like the details are really important. I remember years ago reading that the... Um, the tips of the leaves in spring were kind of edible and uh, you know I found the plant for the first time and uh, I thought well I'll, I'll give that a go and it's like you know it's all prickly like holly and like even in the spring like the new growth on like the established plants it was just like you know it was tough and it was kind of still prickly and I just thought I just I just don't I just don't get it and you know, how can anyone consider that edible? And it was really an example of one of those things where not, not enough detail is given. So I'm going to give you that detail once I find some. And, uh, yeah, you'll understand what I mean about how I got confused. But what it really means to get the, the, the new growth, the new tip. So see, I'm going to just... Leave you a second, see if I can find some. So there we've got a, a small kind of stand of a butcher's broom. If it's not a plant you're familiar with, you could almost think it was like like a small holly or something on a distance. We've got a kind of large holly up there. But, you know, it's the same kind of colouring. And when, when we look at the leaves and you can see how... Well, that you, well, you might, might not be able to see... Actually, look, it's in blossom now. Let me see that. Oh, 
And so, yeah, it's actually quite sharp and prickly. So I kind of always thought that it was the new growth from the top that was kind of referenced in the books because it wasn't really clear. But what it's talking about is the new spring growth. And when you consider that this plant is in the um, Asparagaceae family, so obviously because of that, very closely related to asparagus, then you might think, well, if we kind of look underneath, we might find some new growth that's kind of asparagus-like. Now, it's a little bit early for it, but I think if we look hard enough, we might be able to find some. I can see one little bit there already. Um, I'm going to flip this around and zoom in out a little bit. So it's that little one there, which kind of be nice. But actually, that's what I was looking at, but there's some much more obviously asparagusy ones and just kind of snap it off where it's tender. So this one here, it's kind of quite long, but so I'd, I'd kind of snap that just like asparagus, you snap at the tender point. And kind of in there, let's see how it's quite long and thin. It snaps very easily. There's that lovely one there. Actually, it's not, it's not too early at all. It's uh, just, just the right mo moment. So, I think I'll get a, quite a few of these. And this is a perennial plant, so so taking a few is not going to do any harm because this these just overwinter as a kind of evergreen. But somewhere in this woodland, there are much bigger stands, and I'm just looking around because I want to show you the berry because sometimes well virtually any time of the year you can see the odd berry well I have done anyway but not on this one because that's what first drew me to the plant so I got a little handful from the cluster there but I I spotted through there can you see it and I, I just kind of come out slightly just so you can see how hard it is to spot if you're just walking along the outside of a woodland. But it's always worth kind of honing your eyes and kind of peering in if you're not, if you're just walking along a footpath. So we've got a lovely bigger stand of the plants here. Look at this. Oh, actually, I can actually see some berries too. Look at this, it's quite extensive. It's like here and And here, 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 look, it even goes like all the, all the way around over there. This is a, actually, this is a really, really nice, nice colony. So I should be able to get quite a bit. But I thought I'd, I'd talk about these berries because, yeah, it kind of illustrates something kind of quite interesting for me is, can you see? Can you see those? Aren't they such a gorgeous jewel, ruby jewel-like red against the green? Yeah. So, we are. I'll put this down. 
So I read a long time ago that, well first I was aware that you know some people spoke about using the seeds of asparagus to make coffee um, and you can actually get genuinely wild asparagus and I don't mean the stuff that some people call bath asparagus which I think is Star of Bethlehem could be wrong I think it is right I've never never actually eaten eaten that but actually yeah just like cultivated asparagus but growing wild I know a great place for that around here but yeah I haven't used the, the, the seeds of that but so I was aware that there was that potential so I thought, well, maybe butcher's broom seeds. So well, a number of years, it must have been like six, seven years ago. Maybe it was a bit longer, but I gathered lots of these. And well, what I did is that I got the seed out. Let's see, it has it's quite big white off-white seed so it's almost like a tooth it's very much like a tooth ah it fool someone into thinking you've lost a tooth um but so yeah i roasted these i think about 200 degrees for about 45 minutes in the oven till they were kind of like lovely coffee bean kind of roasted colour and I made a coffee as I like it milk and sugar and I thought just you know what this is going against common sense like not only what I advise people but in term, terms of what I was feeling comfortable with and you know what I advise people is you know ideally when you're working with new plants there should be if you want to stay kind of really safe, a long tradition of use of the plant in the way that you're intending to use it. Because, you know, just because one part of a plant is edible, that doesn't necessarily imply that another part is. But anyway, I'd felt drawn to, to make this coffee, but I felt nervous. And, uh, but you know what? I've, I've made it, I'm gonna sleep on it, and I'm gonna see what comes up. And yeah, I'll see how I feel in the morning. So I was kind of feeling like 40% it's kind of okay before I went to bed. So I kind of went to bed, coffee there by my bedside. And I thought, well, I'll see if anything comes up in dreams or if there's some kind of impression that you know can happen. And there was nothing very specific about dreaming about that plant but I did get just a general kind of sense throughout the night of a, a kind of benignness that's all I can say and I woke up in the morning and I was like well I'm kind of 60% now but you know 60% isn't really good enough is it so I thought well yeah, I, I'm feeling more confident, but not that confident because really I want to be up in the 90s. And then there was a the sound of a post mail kind of dropping through the letterbox. And I kind of went to have a look. And there was a letter that had taken about two weeks to get to me. And it was from a lovely American forager called sunny savage and she'd sent me a card a letter and a card and the card it was like drawn from the kind of native american tradition and it was of a person of a man i think but could be a woman i'm not sure um sitting by a tree and the caption was I think it was, if you ask them, they will tell you. <laughs> so I went to get some more of this plant and I put it by my bed. And 
I went to sleep again the following night, but with the kind of intention of asking about it, asking um, about the edibility of, of the seeds and the, and the coffee. And, and yeah, I feel that what came was a, a, a definite yes. So I woke up that morning, the next morning, and I was like feeling 99% that I'm, I'm okay with it. So yeah, you might be horrified that now I've got a coffee that's like over a day, a day old. You're really a coffee connoisseur. But anyway, I reheated it and I drank it and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. So there are many approaches to gaining knowledge about wild plants. And I often juggle different approaches. It's a really kind of factual, logical, botanical, scientific approach. And then a more intuitive, perhaps even shamanic approach. And I think they both work really well together. And I think it's better to use both rather than just rely on one. But this is a great stand, so I'm going to see if I can increase the size of this handful of butcher's broom shoots. So, plenty more. There's enough there for me to enjoy over the next few days, actually, or a couple of days with my family. I would say about this, personally I wouldn't eat it raw. I've not looked into whether you can eat it raw. I mean you can eat regular asparagus raw, but this is not regular asparagus. Same family, different plant, butcher's broom, and it's much more bitter than um, actual asparagus. So one thing that you could do is you could I mean, if, if, you're, if you don't mind bitterness, I mean, I, I had some last year, which I just steamed and I ate with some butter and uh, a bit of lemon juice, salt and pepper, just like eating asparagus. And it was enjoyable, but it was noticeably bitter. So to moderate that, you could boil it briefly in a change of water, but I'm gonna cook it in a, in a way that I've done previously that really balances out that bitterness and makes it a really real joy to eat. So there we are. Butcher's broom, asparagus. The thing I like to do a lot this time of the year is use leaves as wraps. I talked in one video and demonstrated using our common dock for doing that. And Actually, we're just passing the season where wild garlic leaf was great for that. But right now, there's a couple of things that I can really think that are worth using. One is garlic mustard. We've got some gorgeous samples here. So lovely, big, fresh, tender leaves. Get a few of those. And then one more, actually one or two more. And then we're going to get another one, which is uh, from a tree. Mm, sweet. Still don't know where to look. <laughs> so the other leaf, which is really good as a wrap, much more mild tasting compared to garlic mustard is a uh, lime tilia genus so I'm looking at these ones here and they're they're much more advanced than I'd expected because a lot of them are just about to come into flower and see because I mean traditionally that's probably what's most well known is the the tea linden tea from the lime blossom, from these little winglets there and the immature blossom that's forming. But 
I've just been walking around and getting some really nice big leaves, like the biggest ones I could find. I had a look at the base of the tree in there, because often you find good ones there, but there, there weren't any. And uh, yeah, I've just been looking at these lime nail galls caused by a mite. So obviously we're gonna gonna leave those ones although you know given my penchant for using strange <laughs> ingredients yeah there is part of me that's thinking well that's kind of really lovely I wonder if you can eat it <laughs> I need to switch that part of my brain off sometimes so there we are got some lime leaves so we could use them in a salad but I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna use them as a wrap so let's go and uh, get wrapping you see this, did I say this is quite near a busy road at the back there? Normally I wouldn't pick somewhere like this so much, but just in the park here. And uh, yeah, it's kind of ironic because where I normally live, I'm staying with my mother at the moment, where I normally live there's great lime trees in the garden, like far away from any road, but uh, that's all right. We're working with what we've got, and wherever they are, they're still as beautiful. Look look at the, the, the shape, isn't that lovely? Actually, <clears throat> while I'm here, I just remembered there's quite a lot of cherry trees around here. So, I'm also very tempted to check out if there's any fruit, yes. I thought there would be some young fruit. There's some ones just through here that I expect are a little bit more advanced because they're a little bit more out in the sun. And I've never done this before and I'm gonna have to research if it's safe to do so but that is kind of making them capers out of them essentially there we are because they're just like caper berries in terms of appearance so I think I'm going to gather a few of those few more. See you back at the house. So my mother's just asking me what I've been foraging and uh, I've just tipped them all out on the table. What do you, th what do you think? Well, they look very pretty. They're in kind of little clusters, aren't they? Yeah. Can I eat one then? You can try, try one. I'll try one. I'm always... I mean, they don't really taste of anything, but I think it's the texture that's lovely. Texture's but... Right, let's see. No. You think. Oh dear, wait a minute, I've got a stalk. Right, let's see. Mmm, they're crunchy. Oh, they're quite nice. I'm really surprised. Now, much nicer than I thought they would be. What do you think they are? Mmm, some kind of berries. They look just like berries, don't they? Mmm. Well, what are they? I mean, it's, they take their name, their common name, from... A berry in a sense and that they're, they're called something something berry and they're called currant 
Currant berry. Currant something. Or do you current, think it's currant beans? Do you think it's a fruit? Oh no, it's a vegetable. Hmm. Is it? No, oh, it's I I'd be <laughs> it's one stage, and there's two very different stages. One one stage is a kind of flat disc on the underside of oak leaves, and the other forms in the the catkins of of the oak. Well, you see that really? you see that. Well, you see these those bits. Yeah. So that's the catkin of the oak, and then these are laid. Well, the eggs are laid in the catkins of the oak at the kind of beginning of April by... Who by, lays the eggs? It's, it's a gall wasp. Oh, I've eaten it! <laughs> oh. It's an oak gall wasp. But here's the fascinating thing about oak gall wasps. What they do is they induce the oak to... Essentially, they, they get... The cells, I guess, to act a bit like stem cells, so that they re de they develop in do a they different. They renew the oak. No, no. But what they do is help renew the oak. How do you mean? Well, put more life into it in the spring, kind of thing. No, not not at all. I mean, it's, it, it's considered a parasite. Oh right. Because it, it it's it takes from the oak. It doesn't oh, really. Oh, you give... don't really want it on the oak tree. Well, I mean, who? Well. People that have oak trees, I suppose. Well, I don't know, actually. I was reading about it, and there were a few articles of saying, like, yes, people inquiring, how do you get rid of mm. oak galls? And which surprises me, because, you know, when I see them, I thought they were really beautiful. Like, why would you want to get rid of them? Yeah, they are beautiful. But the point is, anyway, it, it somehow influences the, the, the plant tissue to... to develop in a way that it would never normally do so essentially what what it what it's doing is it's creating a little incub a very nutritious mm -hmm. incubation chamber for the grub so the the grub has got all the food it needs just to, inside this little gall and does it emerge it does emerge i'm not sure what time of year this one emerges possibly and what does it look like it's a really tiny little wasp. Oh, oh um, a wasp, is it? A, a wasp. winged, a, a winged creature. A winged creature, creature <laughs> it is. Oh, oh, well, I feel better it's winged and not a little worm that I've been eating. But, I mean, you've probably heard of, like, oak galls being used for making ink. Have you? No. I, I even think the Magna Carta was written in oak gall. Oh, yes, ink. yes, I do, I do, basically. Yeah, yes, and, I do. And, and the reason is because they're generally very high in tannin. Oh. So it's the marble gall that I've used to make ink for that one, which it looks like a Malteser. Oh, yeah. Um, about the size of Malteser, not quite as dark brown, but kind of brown. And, um, yeah, you kind of use them after the grubs vac vacated, or the wasp has vacated, rather. And, um, and where do they go, these wasps, then? What happens to them, exactly? Well, it depends on species. There's one that... Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know where they go. <laughs> well, they if you were they near, fly. They fly around and they lay their eggs. If you were near an oak tree, would you one day see a kind of little? Oh, yeah, you do. Or... Yeah, you do sometimes. Oh, I've right. even seen them exiting out their little holes. Yes, yes. But um, oh, that's quite interesting. I must say. I mean, they have a very interesting life cycle because you get it's so one wasp will have two different stages of of the gall. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's kind of partly thought, like this one will have, it's like a spangle, have the spangle gall, which is like the disc underneath the leaf, and it have this, the um, the current gall in the, in the, um, the catkin. And what, one, one thought is that because they get predated by other wasps, so if there's two different stages, both producing grubs, different kind of larvae, like hatching uh, one out. One will eat the other. Well, no. One might be found by wasp, but the other, which is often an underground um, part, mm -hmm. actually I'm thinking of oak apple, um, oh, yeah. it won't be attacked by the same wasp that would attack it above ground. But I guess it just gives it more of a chance. Oh, and it's certainly quite edible, I must say. I, I so, much like okay, so I've got some ideas of how I'm going to use this. I, what, what would be your 
thoughts, initial thoughts? Not to tell anyone what they were. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, they, I don't think it would even be put in their mouth. No, but... But if you didn't know, they... they I don't think you'd get any complaints, really. I don't think they taste of anything very much, though. But I, I just like the crunchiness. Yeah, so how might you use them? Uh, on something softer, you want a crunch on the top, I suppose. Sweet or savoury? Oh, either, I think. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm thinking because both, too. got flavour either way. So well, the, this is a good thing. They've got great crunch. I think they'd be all right on both. They're neutral. And you could possibly get flavour in into them. Well, their texture is, is certainly nice. Yes. I think I'm pretty brave, actually. I think you're very brave and very impressive. Um, hopefully, people um, watching don't think I'm completely <laughs> irresponsible, awful son. <laughs> no, no, that's right, no. Yeah. No, no, you're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Thank, thank you. That's high, high praise, high praise. Boil some sugar. Just let that dissolve and then heat it up without stirring to get to that. I don't know what, what you call that point, but anyway, the point that's perfect for making toffee apples. Well, I've got some sugar boiling. Hopefully I'm going to time this right. I'm um, going to pickle some of these. I found a, there's no, not many jars around here, but I found, very pleased, some 10 year old pickled wild garlic bowls. They taste just like, yeah, kind of the pickle you have in a plowman. So I don't know what I pickled them with, but I was pleased to find them and the jar. So I've got some just generic pickling spice. It's got coriander seed, yellow mustard seed, ginger, whole cloves, pimento, black peppercorns, and crushed chilies. So, a little bit of that in there. And fill up the gel. Bit of white wine vinegar. I'm going to do two versions of this. I've never done this before. I'm going to keep some raw like this. I've got another jar which I'll do cooked. Right. So I've had these soaking over, overnight and there's a cocktail stick in my mouth. Take them out of there. So the idea behind this is like years ago, back in 2000, I went to China and what's quite commonly sold in the streets is Chinese hawthorn berries on long skewers like this and they're about the berries about twice the size of these and then they're done basically in exactly the way I'm doing them like mini toffee apples. Let's go for some red ones. Oh got a slightly strange one at the end. Right, see how the sugar is. Hmm. It's a bit of a gamble because I don't, I don't know. 
temperature wise. Um, but let's see, I'm going to do it. I don't know if you can see, but we've got the kind of little glassy, it's like molten glass. Right. That's it. Perfect. We'll do one more. This time we'll turn it green and red like the it's just going caramelly now so I want to risk touching it it's super hot That's all coming off. Look, it's all just come off. Let's try that again. Ow, 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 ow. Gee. Ah! That's better. Perfect. Yeah, the other stage, it wasn't quite brittle, which is probably why when you saw me handling it, I didn't burn myself, which isn't, you know, the best test <laughs> using your finger. But yeah, that's just as I imagined. So there they are. I'm going to see if I can get any live reaction. <laughs> in terms of the tasting. Um, <clears throat> see who comes down first. Yeah, I've just been cleaning the pan and <clears throat> and then like the caramel's coming out and I thought wouldn't it be fun if rather than use a cocktail stick I could create my own stick from the caramel so that it's all uh, edible. Like, I've tried to get a few there Let's just see if that works. I've got some here and I've just I've just made a hole through them with a the cocktail stick. So okay, let's try and put a caramel stick through the middle of them. Oh yes, it did. It did work. Uh, of course, I imagine once I uh, put that into hot caramel, it will kind of dissolve again. So uh, mm. Let's see. Oh, oh, are these the things that um you got yesterday? Yeah. And you've what have you done? They look well, lovely. I've done them in a way that when I went to China they did Chinese hawthorn on skewers like little toffee apples. So oh, aren't they pretty? Can I touch them? Yeah. Are they hard? Yeah, but they're sticky. I haven't done that the chefy trick, which is like to keep the moisture away, you kind of store them in a box with um, silica gel kind of crystals. Oh, that's like a separation. good idea. I don't have any of those. So like the sooner they're eaten, the better. Oh, but... so you want me to try one? What, would you like to try one? Yeah. Well, would it be like it was yesterday? Yeah, so they're, they're, they're raw, essentially, but they've just got... Okay. Kind of a... Shall I? Ready? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to start here. 
Why would you say that? Oh. Oh. Mmm. Mm. Very, very nice. Because I, I wonder if they partially cook. Do they partially cook? I haven't tried one myself yet. They're softer. Yeah, I'm try this one. Oh, crunch. Mmm. <laughs> Delicious. Mmm. Not very good. Like. Really nice. It's almost like a little apple, isn't it? Mmm, really nice. So, I was imagining that in that going with a. Because they're from oak, like with some kind of acorn panna cotta, or even like on a. some kind of cocktail. Yeah. Or, Either, either would be good. Um, and honestly, strangely, I'd be happy to eat mine with a little bit of cheese. Maybe a little bit of bluey cheese mm. might be quite nice well, as well. Every, everything's good with blue cheese. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're like on a cheese board or something. Mm, yeah. yeah, that would look lovely. Mm, they're, they're really nice. Mm, great. Yeah, impressed. <laughs> <laughs> it's good when an experiment works out as you kind of have it, imagine it in your mind. Yeah, yeah. No, they're really, really pretty. Oh, you have to be careful when they're setting that they don't stick to the thing and then it'll break. Yep. Yeah, I think if you left them a little bit longer, they'd go like glass, wouldn't they? Um, You mean if I'd cook the sugar a bit longer? Maybe, yeah. Um, In some places, it's going really hard. Right, yeah, it's, it's, it's because they were done at slightly different stages. Mm. That's, that, that's why yeah. um, some are harder than others. But they're beautiful, especially when they catch the light. Really, really pretty. Yeah. Aren't they? Good. So a culinary a triumph. <laughs> <laughs> a bizarre, <laughs> strange triumph. Yes, very that good. This morning I've just woken up and uh last night I washed the uh, jelly of fungus really well in a couple of changes of water to get all the bits of dirt out, picked off the bits of wood. And what I normally do I just kind of leave them on the side in a warm room for a couple of days to dry. Or in the sun to dry but I kind of wanted to do this quickly so I put them on this nighttime storage heater and now you can see and hear that they're hard now fully dried which is just what I want sometimes you can just pick them off like this but the ones the ones that I gathered that you saw, they were they were starting to dry, but they were still very, very soft. So that's the first stage. So I've got some dry ones. And the story behind why I started doing this is kind of back in 2004, I was running a course for kids and with my kind of, I don't know, puppy-like enthusiasm. I ran into the woods with them and there were lots of fresh jelly ears on, on a tree and uh, it was on a, on a, it was on a, I, actually it was, wasn't on an elder as it normally is, it was on a big fallen sycamore trunk. So there's lots of them there and uh, yeah, I kind of ran in with them and they just started gorging on them fresh. Um, you know, kind of excitedly saying how wonderful these these were, and I kind of turned round, and uh, it wasn't the reaction I expected. What actually happened was that they <laughs> recoiled in horror. It's not surprising, really, um, given that kind of we live in a culture that's, I don't know, pretty mycophobic, as they say, a bit fearful of fungi. So, what I learned was it's all about the presentation and the you know the de delivery so i was running a course a few weeks later and i thought you know what I've, I've got to do something different in my presentation so what i did um and i'm going to do do this now back to kind of 15 years ago or whatever it was um the first time i did this so get them dried and what i did then what i'm going to do now is i put some in Rehydrated in orange juice. I actually did some in 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 Ribena, like un undiluted Ribena, 
Now, the other thing, I've been looking around, there's, there's not much here. Like since then, I've done lots of adult versions. My sister's just given me this, which she says she doesn't like, which is uh, salted caramel cocoa vodka. It's not much there. But the thing I most, a couple of things I most frequently do this in is Grand Marnier or something like cherry brandy or slow gin that I've, I've made. So the other thing we've got around here, we've got this Kahula coffee liqueur. I'll try a bit of that. I've never used that before. I've often put it in my own kind of liqueurs that I've made as well, which is kind of nice. I'll we'll put some in there and never done this before, but it's a kind of obvious thing is I just made a strong coffee and I'm going to put some in there. So there we are. I kind of leave them there to, uh, where are we? Rehydrate. Probably take a couple of hours. And uh, yeah, if you're doing this in the kind of large quantities or you want to soak them and store them, you really need to do it in something like Grand Marnier, something that's uh, certainly about 30% uh, alcohol. Well, they're not 30, well, these spirits are kind of like 40, aren't they? 30. 40, but something that's gonna it's got enough alcohol to preserve it and you can store it obviously if you do them in in, in coffee like this it's going to be fine when we come on to the, the next stage but it's not going to keep for that long maybe a few few days a week or so in in, in the fridge but anyway let's let those rehydrate and then we go on to the next stage anyway the point i didn't finish the story did i the point was <laughs> that after doing this with orange juice and Ribena, this next course I had with the kids, I stood outside of the woods with them and we were talking about fungi, you know, the whole ecology of fungi, the magic of fungi, the beauty of fungi, and the different places where they can grow, you know, on, um, from the, like the soil substrate, from living on living trees, on dead trees, but anyway, I was just kind of priming them to think, well, they could be up there, they could be down there. But the main thing is I, I had these rehydrated chocolates, which um, I kind of then be, after doing this, dipped in melted chocolate and dried. So I presented these um, and I said they were fungi and they, to observe the shape and the textures, and I looked at the shape and I got them to kind of eat them first. And I said, we're going to go and try and find them. I'm not going to tell you where they are. It could be on the ground. It could be elsewhere. But um, so they all ran into the woods really excitedly. Kind of silence for a few minutes while they're all kind of looking around. And then excited shouts and yips of, whee, is this it? Woohoo! It's um, Fergus, Fergus, is this, is this the mushroom? Is this the mushroom? <laughs> And of course, I'd, I'd gone to a place where there were, with a little bit of searching, you could find lots of, of jelly here. So they were successfully finding them. And uh, from having looked at the texture, um, and, well, not looked at, sorry, looked at the shape and then experienced that the texture through eating them, then, uh, you know, it's like the experience was like so far removed from <laughs> the first experience of recoiling in horror and I thought it was a really good thing to um, get yeah get the kids excited about fungi because actually although yes we were looking at them in terms of food I often think like to kind of counter the fear of fungi particularly when you're you're introducing children to fungi is to think of them like first well, first of all, kind of do something really creative with them. So it's kind of more a, a kind of fun thing. But often, like, that creativity, I would say, don't involve food first. So it could be like using fungi, like King Alfred's cakes, for making fire or for making paint. Like other fungi for making paper, 
making natural dyes and uh, th this kind of thing and then when you've got them excited about fungi and gosh, all the amazing ways that kind of fungi function in the environment then perhaps like move move on to food anyway that's enough rambling on let's let them rehydrate and then i'll show you how i how i uh, do the next chocolate stage so they've soaked now for a couple of hours and i'm just going to take them out and put them on this plate and we'll see how much bigger they are well i'm going to forget which ones are which and that doesn't really matter that would be a, just a, a surprise when i come to taste them and there we are. a couple more that one and the ones in the coffee liqueur now at this stage isn't strictly necessary i just find it's a lot easier if you do it that way which is put them in the freezer overnight and then just wait and we're ready be ready for the next stage i've melted some dark chocolate i kind of like to use at least kind of 70 percent cocoa solids but you could try with other chocolate i've done it with white chocolate as well so in a double boiler and it's really kind of important to have long needles for this i've got some short ones here it's not going to work quite so well but this is what i had so got the mushrooms in the freezer now this step isn't strictly necessary you can do it without this i just find that the fungi are a little bit easier to handle if you do this so i'm just going to dip it thoroughly in the melted chocolate so you might have to move it around a bit so it really gets in the crevices Sometimes they fall off at this point, but because you need to kind of shake it, get off the excess chocolate. See, there's quite a lot of excess on this one. Oh, what happened? You're, you're in the, I can't get through. I can't get oh. through. Yeah, I know it's good. I just can't get through. Right, okay. Is it, we're carrying on. So, so can I go back in again and then zoom back out? I can edit it. So I'm just going to do the next stage, which is put it somewhere to dry. So I find a notice board is really useful. With a bit of newspaper to catch any drips and also it will drip down a little bit while it's still wet that's one i just did so you can kind of wipe that off so you can maintain the shape so yeah of course you could put these on baking parchment or a non-stick surface but i find if you do that and you haven't shaken the chocolate off perfectly or really well it kind of pulls around which is kind of not a bad thing but i think in this way you really maintain just the shape of the mushrooms, which is kind of really nice. I'll just finish off and do the others. So it's about an hour later, and in that time they've, they've set solid, and they go a kind of matte color. So you kind of know, or kind of matte appearance rather. So you kind of know if they're ready. So let's give one a try. I'm not sure what, flavor this is going to be obviously chocolate but what was what was the uh, what was the marinade if you like 
Mm. Coffee. Wow. That is really good. Text is great. And uh, mm. yeah, I mean it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Things dipped in chocolate are, are kind of gonna be good, but it just does work particularly well. So Most of the things that we found, I brought back, I've kind of set up to show you how we're going to cook them. Let's have a, a more detailed look at what there is. So we've got our butcher's broom, our ash leaves, I also got some young ash keys. Got the immature cherries, and what I'm going to do with this is, is an experiment. I'm going to do them the same way I would do pickled um, elderberry capers, like green immature elderberry fruit. So I'm going to heavily salt them. don't have any salt at the moment. That's what I'm going to do. Heavily salt them, cover them with salt essentially, leave them for about five days. And then I'm going to uh, boil up some vinegar with some spices, some sugar, and put those in a jar, tip it over them, and then kind of leave it until I think it's worth tasting them. So we've got the, the current ghouls, I've hot pickled two, and these are cold pickled. You see the difference actually, you can, because the cold pickle, the kind of green ones, stay green, but it's been a kind of melding of colours on that one. We have, for making the hash browns, we've got burdock root, grated, carrot, onion. We have, well, I'll tell you what that is in a second, um, the garlic mustard leaf and the lime leaves, which are going to stuff with We've got a selection of things here. We've got feta, marinated smoked tofu, um, slow roast cherry tomatoes, and a selection of pickles I'll tell you about. Uh, some marinade for the leaves, and our burdock stem. I'm gonna grate a little bit more, and uh, yeah, let's go. So let's start with the hash browns and the uh, burdock. So let's just pr quickly run through this again. So we strip that down, really easily done. Very quickly done, but there's a, there is a little bit of refinement which I didn't mention before. Is that you may find, once you strip the main bits down, that it's helpful to kind of snap and then just drag like fibres off like the rest of it. So for example, I snap there, see there's some extra fibres and then we can drag it that way. Snap it again. And I drag those off. So. That's all nice and tender. And you can see a couple on there still. Oh, oh yeah, big bit. Missed that. So I've well, got a nice bundle of those. And a great those. Mentioned, I think I mentioned before, this is just one way of using these. You can also, you could just um, steam them or bake them, you could tempura them, you could candy them. I have tried pickling them, but they went all mushy. Well, you know, there's really no end to the, the possibilities of working with a lot of these ingredients. I think it's just down to your imagination. And although 
you know, there are all those different cooking techniques that I just mentioned, baking, frying, candying, all the rest of it. What I love about wild food is that, to a certain extent, it doesn't come with a whole load of baggage of, you know, like if you learn traditional French cookery or, or British cookery or Asian cookery, or Chinese cookery, you know, specific by region. Like, you know, it comes with a whole load of rules and, yeah, great ideas and inspiration. But I think working with wild food, sometimes you're liberated by that and you can just explore to your heart's content. Right, I'm going to finish off that later because, just to illustrate really. So add it to what we've got already. You see actually how, how the stuff I've just put in there is much kind of whiter and the stuff underneath really brown. Because yeah, it does really discolour. So then, just kind of mix all that together. So it's quite wet, and we don't want our hash browns to be too wet. So what we do is I've got a bowl and a cloth. I'm just going to squeeze that. Squeeze out the liquid, just the excess liquid. <laughs> really hot now. So we've got all that. Now we're not going to waste that because that actually could be turned into into crisps in the oven. Spread it on a non-stick surface and kind of bake them. Because I think it's really lovely not to waste things and make use of everything that you can. In fact, talking of that, I said I was going to mention that, didn't I? And I, I didn't. But that there is my second snack to keep me going when I'm doing this. Had a sweet one there. This is a savoury one because. While we were out at the field edge collecting the burdock, I kind of mentioned a chefy thing that you could do with the veins. So that's why I'm enjoying this. Check this out. So here they are, some burdock leaf stem fibres. Kind of tough and inedible, but fibre can be our friend. It's not necessarily just a waste product or something to stick on the compost. So it's kind of a chefy thing that I discovered last year. So bundle it all up, heat some oil, deep fry them. Make little nests just till they're golden brown really. Try and keep it all together nicely and until all the green's gone and what was tough and inedible becomes really enjoyable almost there there we are burdock fiber nests put it on some absorbent paper 
So I've done this with Japanese knotweed fibres and grape plantain fibres and fennel fibres. Let's add a little bit of salt. Yeah. Um, hogweed fibres, got to be careful of that one because of the, the sap. But there we are. It's the principle of where possible, don't waste anything. Mm. Can you hear how crunchy that is? So we've got our mixed burdock and potato, a bit of salt and pepper. Where's the salt? One beaten egg. Now, some people might add flour to their hash browns, but I prefer not to. Let's give that a good mix. We're going to fry them. So I got the pan ready and I did actually add one more egg. Just thought it needed a little bit more. But yeah, you could just use flour as, as well or instead of egg. So it's going to form them into about that size. They should take about five or six minutes, kind of three, three minutes on each side. I want to get them in quite quickly. I mean, you could just make one massive one and then cut it up. But it's kind of nice to have the individual ones. And just while that's cooking, I'm going to, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I am going to do this. I'm going to blanch the butcher's broom asparagus. I've got some boiling water here. I mean, literally, I'm going to do that for about 15 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, once it comes back up to the boil. it up a little bit. One thing I like to do with these is kind of press, press down a little bit just to kind of firm them, firm them up. Of course one thing you could do is you could add chickpea flour and well either do it in the same way or deep fry them. Chickpea flour and uh, spices and kind of turn them into pakoras, which are always lovely. Surprisingly, 
surprising how long it takes to come up to the boil, even though it was boiling rapidly when I put those in. Now, to this I've added a little bit of ghee. This one was olive oil in here, but either would have been okay. And, yeah, as I said with the, with the uh, butcher's broom asparagus, we could just steam it, but it's slightly bitter. I mean, quite bitter, and I, mean, I like bitter. So, we're moderating that with a bit of spice. I put some, what have I put in there? Some smoked paprika and uh, a bit of cayenne chili pepper. Just toss that over for a little bit. Should have turned them over in the order I put them in, really, shouldn't I? salt and pepper. ash leaves they're slightly bitter so I'm going to do a similar thing I'm going to blanch these a couple of changes of water So everything's cooked, just got to do the leaf wraps, which are, make a really nice starter. So I'll kind of take you through that. Now, both of these leaves, as I mentioned, you could use as a salad, the, the garlic mustard, you could make a pesto from. Not so much the lime leaves, because that's very mild. Uh, the other thing in this recipe, we could actually steam these first and use them that way. We could use them just as they are, au natural, just kind of naked in a sense. But um, yeah, I'll probably do some like that, but 
The other thing that's kind of nice is to have a bit of marinade. So what I got there is some balsamic vinegar, some mustard, a little bit of sugar. Uh, what else did I put in there? Tiny bit of garlic powder, uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of chili. So I'm just going to skewer a few things. So on this one, a little bit of feta, slow roast cherry tomatoes, one of my favourite things, and some wild pickles. So I've got a selection here. This one is consummate flowers and stems. Put that on there. Another tomato. And what else? Ah, oh, so it was interesting. This was like the 10 year old pickled wild garlic bulbs, which are really interesting because the, the, the bigger ones, I thought I'd keep this to show you because I was just cutting them down to size. So the bigger ones really don't work because you already see those fibres in there, which are really quite bristly. And, but the smaller one, smaller ones, and in fact, sometimes it wasn't, it didn't even relate to size, but the smaller ones generally, or any one that you cut that slices through cleanly and really easily, doesn't have any fibres on, so, or in it rather. So that's, let's finish with a, another bit of feta. Give it a wrap. Just going to turn these in a little bit. That's better. Then just pull out the middle one. So it's just to help it get on there. So that one, it was raw and naked. And I wrapped it with the veins on the outside just because it kind of looks, looks nice. This one, I'm going to marinate a little bit. Just take off the excess. And I like, I like the veins on the outside, so I'm going to do that again. What should we have this time? So this time, let's do one with some marinated tofu. And so I've got here some pickled seaweed and you'd be right in thinking it doesn't have the greatest appearance but it doesn't matter because it's going to be wrapped up inside. Slow roast cherry tomato. Fold the edges in on the leaf. Actually, once you've marinated it, look, it sticks a lot more easily. Wrap it tightly round. Skewer it. 
remove the first skewer and then that's going to become the top skewer for your next one you don't have to do it this way but I just find it a lot easier rather than just putting the thing straight in um, right let's do a garlic mustard one but be careful of this it's a it's a bit more of a tender leaf than the lime so you could rip it quite easily when you're wiping off the excess oil there. I'm going to do this with the, the green side. Now what pickle haven't I shown you? I know. Two of those. I really love slow roast cherry tomatoes. I put them on salads and all sorts. So here's a pickle which we see it's hollow, it's circular, it's very soft so it doesn't work so well as a pickle but it's a pickled Japanese knotweed. So put that on there. Some more of it. It's a raw pickle. Remove that bit of extra stem at the edge there. Fold these over. You see, it's, what I've done is I've just removed that bit on the garlic mustard leaf. So I love heart shaped things. But boom, 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 boom. And I'm going to fold it over wrap it really tight You are that one. And I'll do one more au natural, although it's getting some of the marinade. I'll do that on the outside so you can see the veins. See, let's do another feta one. Better slow roast, slow roast tomato, serrated rack seaweed, wild garlic, bulb, that banging if you can hear it is the, the lid of the slow cooker going up and down as something's cooking in it. There we are. What didn't I show you? One thing I didn't show you is 
Uh, this, ha this is, happens a lot when I'm foraging, and I, I gather, and I love the act of, of just being out there and gathering. But another aspect, which can occasionally be frustrating, but it's also a, can be a lovely part of it, is that there's quite a bit of processing afterwards. So all these immature wild cherries, I uh, sat down for half an hour and I kind of picked off all the top bits, just like the remains of the, the flower. Pick that off and a little dark bit on the top, it's done. Right, I'm going to show you the plate that's under the tripod because it's, uh, it's looking very enticing. It's got everything that's been cooked so far, so I'm just going to add these. And just show you one more thing. I've gone outside now because the light's a lot better. So initially, I didn't have any plan to combine these things or even present them together, but I found this lovely plate, so that's what's happening. So I've got the butcher's broom, asparagus, and I would say, although I bought that in a change of water, there is still quite a bit of bitterness in there, so if that's something you might find challenging, I would say do it in two changes of water. The hash browns are great, but in the second batch that I did, I added a lot more salt, so they're much, much better that way. On the outside, we have the ash leaves, sprigs of ash leaves, and ash keys which I've boiled in two changes of water about a minute each time I've I've kind of let get cold and then I've dragged through spicy oil absolutely delicious and then of course the the leaf wrapped um, pickles so there we are just a few things that we could do with some of the seasonal wild foods that are available right now. Isn't that just so adorable how the berry grows just under the leaf like that? It just seems so kind of protective and nurturing. Well, I guess that is until a forager comes along who doesn't mind the prickles and the scratches. And in fact, just kind of enjoys it as part of the, the kind of sensual foraging process, just really getting kind of stuck in with the, with, with the plants. Cheers. Wow, that's so good. So what I did with the berries, I got them and I put them in, in a small pan and I boiled them for about half an hour with some water. I kind of let it cool. And there wasn't a huge amount of water in there after that and I just kind of mushed, mushed up um, the contents to separate the skins. Like I had to squeeze some of the, the berries to pop the uh, seeds out and uh, yeah then I just kind of got handfuls of it and kind of squeezed so that the, the seeds were popping out and I just had like the skins which I got rid of and then uh, then I just put some water in, in cold water in a pan and just like you know stirred around and kind of tipped off other bits of the fruit because it's quite an unusual one butcher's broom. In fact, I can't, nothing really springs to mind where the berry 
it's actually poisonous, but you can get something good and edible from the seed. Um, I can't really think of any other example. But yeah, it makes a delicious coffee. And I think I enjoy it all the more because, because actually I think this whole video illustrates something which for me is such a big part of the foraging is that it's both the journey, like we've been on a foraging journey, but it's also the destination. So, you know, that journey could be yeah, a journey into the, into the brambles, into like the, the kind of scratchy um, butcher's broom. It would be a journey of just noticing and discovery, going out without any, any plan. And just the, the, the spontaneous things that arise that you notice. And, you know, of course, that could be things that you notice and then you want to forage. But it could just be all those kind of little wonders of nature like yeah the amazing and beautiful contortions that you see of tree trunks or it could just be you know a bee flying around or a flower that's just opened you know all these kind of things Watch, watching ants I spent a, a lot of time just watching ants um, yesterday and of course that journey it can be an inward one as well because when I think uh, about what inspires me to forage, it is so much about like the connection, the connection both with the natural world, but also the connection with myself, myself in relation to the natural world, and. And often that comes through both a noticing outward, but a noticing inward and a journeying in, inward. And I, I feel I've come a little full circle with the butcher's broom coffee because I mentioned this, that foraging friend, Sonny Savage, sent to me, gosh, it must have been eight years ago, maybe longer, maybe 10 years ago, on the day I had boiled up butcher's broom, separated the seeds, roasted them, as I did today for about 45 minutes, 200 degrees, and I made the coffee. And, and I didn't know whether, whether it was safe to drink. And then this, this, you know, this arrived and it said, listen, and, and you can see that, listen and they will teach you so I kind of informally kind of journeyed inside kind of through sleep and kind of got kind of intuition about this being okay but excitingly in the last days a friend of mine yeah who was watching my 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 kind of hawthorn video and just you know we were talking about actually almond essence uh, she's foraging kind of bitter almonds and uh, not in this country and I was just saying how the the hawthorn blossom I gathered which I'd made syrup from fresh was like more almondy than I've ever ever known before because I usually work with dried flowers almost like almond essence and we'd not been in contact for a while and she just felt that she would like to send me a Yeah, a guided kind of meditation, if you like, to do with plants, to kind of go on that inner journey with, with particular plants. And, and because it was the 1st of May, that it would be a good thing to do with Hawthorne. So 
I, I did I did that and I did that you know with the with the kind of intention of listening and they will teach you because because I think it's so important to exercise that capacity um, which is in part the kind of intuitive muscle that I think is atrophied in, in, a, in a lot of us but it's there and it can be activated and it can be used and you know, you might have seen some things in this video, and I've seen some things <laughs> over these days that, you know, previously wouldn't have considered eating. And yes, I've kind of researched them as well, but my initial draw, my initial kind of almost being kind of called into these, 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 these plants um, and potential ingredients, was, yeah, my, my kind of natural curiosity and in, in intuition. But then, yeah, it really was feeling into that capacity to intuit whether eating this particular plant is going to be benign for me or not. Asking the questions. But... Sometimes less formally, sometimes more formally. Anyway, so the point is I started doing this meditation and it's a beautiful one. So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to put a link to the drumming that can really help. So this is, this is, this is a kind of shamanic method of connecting with the plant. But don't be put off by that term shamanic this is really looking at in a large part how you know some of our ancestors ancestors would have engaged with and connected with 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 plants so this meditation it has guide some some guidance of how to approach the plant and questions you might ask while you're trying to kind of intuit and collect and it has a 15 minute drumming, um, shamanic drumming rhythm pattern that goes with it, which is really helpful to get you into a kind of an altered state, really, an altered state which is just in, induced by sound, not by you know, any, any, anything else, by sound and by you sinking into the rhythm and your own question and your own sense of feeling and, and connection as a kind of two-way process between you and the plant. So I really encourage, encourage you to try that, particularly if it's something that you've not experienced before or kind of thought about doing before, because that is such a valuable approach in addition to all the, the kind of, I guess you call it hard nose scientific based research that I do I, 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 I use them in tandem hand in hand like these these two approaches and they really complement complement each other incredibly well so I would just like to finish by saying thank you to my dear mother love you very much and my dear sister for for tolerating me and you know celebrating in a sense what I do in the two weeks that I've come to visit my mother and my sister. And now I'm going back home and my housemates want me to self-isolate for a week. So I'm going to be doing that in the woods and I'm relishing this opportunity to go there and go into the woods, I'll be camping in the woods, I won't have my phone, I won't have my laptop, I've been spending far too much time on both those things <laughs> in recent days. Um, I've also been eating far, far too much rich food, far too much cake. So yeah, I'm just going to go, um, I, I'm not going to use the word detox or cleanse because 
uh, slightly absurd. I, I, I would say more of a kind of just a bit of a purification, really. That in, in, includes kind of meditation and kind of staring at the fire, staring at the at the river. And and I may continue with some videos in the future because I have lots of lots of ideas of I think what might might interest you I mean it certainly interests me so I just hope there's at least a couple of people that would also be interested but this is potentially reaching the end of my journey of wild food in COVID times that journey has involved some delicious foods um, just enjoying the leftovers the uh, butcher's broom asparagus and some actually some crunchy tripe fungus <laughs> I forgot about that didn't I I I know few fungi that have less flavor so I've I've cooked that to crispy with soy sauce. Sorry, no, not with soy sauce, with um, uh, sesame oil and a bit of liquid aminos like soy sauce. And it's delicious. So I hope you've enjoyed the journey. I hope you've enjoyed some of the, the destination, like the foods. And so I would just say, Cheers and goodbye and a final thank you, Sunny, for sending me this card and for your inspiration. And the for and, and the yeah the, the foraging inspiration of others too, because although I've been doing quite long videos, I should just finally add that there's some wonderful videos being put out by other foragers. I think particularly of um one I, I discovered today by my friend Rupert of Buck and Birch. He's doing some really great stuff. Um, his sandwich making one and his his collection of the bulb bulbils of bulbils. Bulbils, how do you say this? The the immature seeds of uh, one form of wild garlic. Well worth a watch. Very entertaining. Um, forage by by fern. That's quite entertaining, especially when she's she's not making cakes but is kind of looking at the plants in, in other ways. And then there's a lot being put out on Facebook, a wonderful page called Foraging for Kids. Now there's lots of, lots of different foragers putting stuff out there. So well worth a look, kind of really short introductions and, and uh, yeah, Foraging as a journey, gosh, I wish that all children, as just part of their kind of play, um, schooling, whether it be formal schooling or homeschooling, you know, have the opportunity now and kind of in the future to, to learn about wild plants as food and medicine and, you know, the other insects and life that they kind of support so that's that's where like the journey you know can begin but remember there's a child in all of us just curious intuitive likes to kind of get out and play and notice so we can always engage with that part of us and get out and get foraging so cheers <laughs>